We're speaking today on the fact that God creates by his word. We create something, we use our hands or some such part of our bodies. God doesn't have a body like us. He creates by his word. And we're going to first look at Song Psalm 62, verse 11. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. So there we have it. Power belongs to God. But how does he know it? The psalmist know it. Because God spoke. And so when we think about the creative acts of God, we know that he does them by his power. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it tells us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Faith is not the evidence. That's the wrong translation in the King James. Faith is not a substance, as I have heard one preacher say. A substance has to do with the occult. And in fact, that preacher then branched off into the occult and likened it to the crystals that somebody believed in from Japan. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now this verse, for, for, for by faith, verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of the things that are visible. God created by his word. He spoke. So he did not need millennia in which to create one thing. He just made it a time span for us of 24 hours when he did his first acts of creation and then the whole six were in a period of six 24-hour days, not 6,000 years that many church people have said. And that belief came into existence because when Darwin promoted his, as it turns out, unproven theory of evolution, many in the churches, the leaders said, well, what are we going to do about it? Genesis 1.1? And so what they did was to make a break. They said, oh, there was a break. And uh, we don't follow along with that at all. The Bible says 24-hour days, and we believe that. Because it is by faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God. And when we look at Genesis chapter 1, we see how God did it. And most of us know the scriptures here, where, for instance, in verse 3, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. He just said. He certainly didn't use the vocabulary we, that any of us have on earth today. We don't know what said means when it comes to God. In actuality, we don't know what sounds there would be. We don't know. There were no angels to hear it anyway. Then we come to verse 6, for instance. God said, let there be an expanse. All the way through the chapter, God said. God said, let us make man in our image. And there is a difference there. He just didn't say. He took of the dust of the ground. Now, how he did that, we don't know. We just know he did it. So it is already established that when God creates, it is through his word. If we look to Psalm 147, verses 15 to 20, no. he sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. 
Isn't that amazing? His word runs swiftly. Obviously, there's something from God himself that penetrates the atmosphere and comes into the earth itself because it runs swiftly. And I don't think that that phrase is applicable about heaven itself, where he dwells. He's talking about earth. So what he says happens almost instantaneously. What does he do? He gives snow like wool. He scatters hoarfrost. He hurls down his crystals of ice and so forth. Verse 18, he sends out his word and melts them. It does something. He makes his wind blow and the winter waters flow. So there we have it again in the Psalms. How even during the earth's existence, God's word is evident according to the Bible. It's evidently occurring all the time. And we never hear it and we never see, we just see the effect. It's obvious. God has his word going out from his throne in relation to the, the atmosphere, the weather. That's what it says. And uh, how often he does not, does that, we do not know. Except that it says he causes the ice to melt and so forth. And he does uphold all things in his hand, it says about Christ in, Col in Colossians. So that means God is active all the time in the ongoing of this earth. He just hasn't put, th put it there and uh, allowed it to run like a clock runs. You wind it up. He does more. He's interactive. And we miss that unless we read those verses. He's interactive in this earth. He's doing things. And his judgments are in all the earth. He is using the weather in judgments, without a doubt. And using other things that occur. And sometimes when you see a country is having unusual hurricanes or something like that, that are really unusual, you just wonder if it's not the judgment of God. And of course... The weather changes daily and the weather changes from century to century and we still have the weather occasionally that I used to have as a child. I just want to look at Psalm 148 verse, verse 5. Let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created. What's he talking about? Praise the Lord from the heavens. The angels would praise him. And you know, we used to sing a song, all the birds praise him. You probably know that, that chorus we used to sing in Sunday school. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. And that would mean, indicate as well, apart from the voice of the angels, and the voice of the host, that the sun, maybe, is not only emitting some sound of praise, the stars certainly sing, but they, uh, they praise him because the very evidence of seeing them is enough for any creature to say, there is a God. God has made those stars. God has made the sun. And it should bring case praise of God in the hearts of humankind. And sometimes it does, and most often it doesn't. Now we're going to look at another aspect, which we'll find also in Psalm 33, verse 9. See, it says here in verse 8, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Most people today are not. Believers should be. Perhaps there will come a time 
when it will occur that every person who has been created will stand in awe. They certainly will be. Those in heaven will be and those in hell will be as they suffer the torments of the damned. Then it says, For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. See, it didn't wobble. Things happened at the time of the flood, when there was a tilt. So I don't know enough about science to know whether it wobbles still. But there are earthquakes, and there were no earthquakes when he created it. That's the result of, of sin and the flood, particularly the flood, because flood is the result of sin anyway. Now we turn to Psalm 107, verse 20, and we come to an aspect where God did something for the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt and when they were in, going to the promised land. It says, He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Now this particularly applies to the time when they were complaining about the bread, uh, the food that they used to get in Egypt. And he judged them and then sent the manna and the quails so that they would have the bread of heaven. And the Bible says, they did cry to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, and delivered them from their destruction. Now, I've heard that used in the Pentecostal church in relation to divine healing. Well, it has nothing to do with divine healing because they weren't sick. They were sin sick. They rebelled against God. They complained against God. So they loathed the food that they were, they were getting as they went through the wilderness, as they were starting to leave Egypt. And they wished they were back there, it tells us, back in the Bible. They wished they were back in Egypt. They didn't appreciate what God was doing. They did not have any idea of the spirituality of their journey out of Egypt. All they thought about was being in Egypt to get the food. It didn't matter if they were still slaves. That was their situation. So then God sent out his word and healed them. The healing was of their sin and delivered them from their destruction because they would have been destroyed by God if he hadn't have showed his mercy. Now we look at, I, w I would like to read Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. It is not totally applicable, but there's something about it that I, uh, applies in my mind. The rock. The wor his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. How often do we hear sermons on that aspect of God in our pulpits today? Well, I have to say I haven't heard one in the last uh, 40 years in, on the occasions when I've been in churches. Let's look at it again. The rock, immovable. His work is perfect. So what he did for the children of Israel in healing them and delivering them out of destruction was perfect for them at that time. It kept them going. It kept them as a nation. They received the manna from heaven. And the manna it was a type of the Redeemer who was to come because he is the bread of life. So even though they didn't realize, they didn't realize it at the time, they were beginning to participate in the work of the Messiah that would take place when he did arrive. And his work was, I am the bread sent down from heaven. 
And God is perfect. His word is perfect. His work is perfect. His ways are justice. And uh, we see that God created the whale, the uh, manna and the quails, an act of creation. How did he do it? Through his word. He just spoke. And the manna came down every day, except Sunday, and they had the quails. Now, did God speak every day? It would seem so, wouldn't it, from what we just read before? Because he's, he, he's, he speaks. His word goes out and things happen in the climate. Things happen in, in our world. So if he was providing the food the first day by his word, he would have done it every day. His word was healing them. His word was saving them from destruction because his word was producing the manner that their bodies needed and the quails that their flesh needed. Now I'd like us to look at words in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ. In Mark 13, we find these words speaking. It's his word. Remember, he's the word of God and his words are the words of God. He said, my words are spirit and they are life. And in this verse, all these things, Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. A parable is not a story so that everybody can understand it. Because he parables were such that the disciples would go to Jesus after he had taught in parables and say, Lord, what did that mean? If they didn't understand it, neither did the crowds. Quite amazing. Yet the crowds acknowledged that the words that he spoke were full of grace. And they recognized he did spoke such as nobody else ever spoke as their scribes spoke, as their Pharisees spoke, as their priests spoke. They recognized there was something about the words of Jesus, even when they were in parables. And it says here, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. You see, in the very next verse, it says, he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. So if they didn't understand what he was saying, certainly the crowds did not understand what he was saying. So he wasn't saying, teaching them so that they might get full understanding because most of the way through the Gospels you'll find the disciples did not really understand. And that's why Jesus would say on one occasion, when the Holy Spirit has come, he will bring all things to your remembrance. They went into their hearts and ears. They forgot them, did not understand them. But then the time would come when the Holy Spirit would give them understanding and they'd be able to teach the understanding they were given by the Holy Ghost. And we do not have a record of them specifically teaching from these parables. But they would have done. They would have... Because Matthew recorded them, they recorded by, all, by the apostles. By some of the apostles, they recorded the parables. So they knew them, or they were led by the Spirit at the time they wrote them, and that meant that they would have been preaching them. So the Word of God, through the lips of Jesus, who is the Word himself, is creative. It does something when it, with understand, uh, it is given understanding. It has the power by the Spirit to create understanding. We think of Jeremiah in chapter 1, verse 5. This is in relation to a creative act of God. 
And he says to Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, God formed him. Do you think that God would have formed Jeremiah and nobody else? This translation says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Well, we know that God gives a spirit to every man. We learned that last week. And it would appear from here that he forms us even in the womb. So God does have his hand in creation all the time by his word, it would be. Then he says of Jeremiah, and we'll mention this, before you were born, I consecrated you. I set you apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Well, there's predestination. There's election. Jeremiah wasn't even in existence. God predestined him to be a prophet to the nations. So there is predestination with God, but not as uh, Calvin has set it out in his books. Reading these verses from Deuteronomy 30, verse 11 to 15. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. This is in relation to the choice between life and death in relation to his commandments. He says, it is not in heaven. So the commandments that God spoke were not in heaven afterwards. Who will ascend to heaven for us to bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. I want to say that word is creative because that word spoken there is quoted by Paul in Romans chapter 10, 6. We see these words. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. You see, the very words that Moses had stated as the word of God in the book of Deuteronomy. Paul uses it by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and carries it over to the gospel age. He brings Christ into it. And he says, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. In your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith that we proclaim. So what is the Apostle Paul saying? He thinks of what Moses had been given to say by God. God commanded him. God told him what to say. And Mos uh, uh, Paul brings it over into the New Testament and he relates it to Christ. And you say, he's saying, who will go up into heaven? Because we need Christ, he's up there. Who will go up into heaven, that is to bring him down? Or when he was in the grave, who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead? No, 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 those things are not necessary. Those things under the law are not necessary. We're under the righteousness that is based on faith which is the righteousness of the gospel age, which is the righteousness of the truth of the gospel. And then it sets out, what does it say? The word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. So this word of faith is the word of God in the gospel that they had proclaimed 
and that we read in, in our New Testament, but moreover, the Holy Spirit puts it in our hearts. It's near us. That living word of the gospel that is based on the righteousness that comes through faith. And then it says, we proclaim it. That is the word. And the word is living. We, we read that in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that the word is living and that it, it divides even between the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrows and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And then Paul goes on to say in Romans 10, verse 9, because, because, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. There is power in that confession because it's not the confession of your own words. It's the confession, Jesus is Lord. Now you are saying it, but what you are saying is gospel truth the very word of that is the righteousness based on faith. We are saying that word, and because it is God's word come to us through Paul, through the word of the Christ, who is the word of the gospel, and because we have heard it, and then we obey it, then it says, if you confess that word with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, the word of God, you see, God has spoken. Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. And then he goes on to say, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Every Jew, whether he is a real Jew or just thinks he is a Jew, and every Gentile come the same way, there's no other way. There's only one way. It's to call on the name of the Lord, who is Jesus Christ, to be saved. That's the only acknowledgement of Jesus Christ that is required. He is not to be acknowledged as a king. He is acknowledged as the Lord and the Savior, as who, the one who has died for us and been risen again. So that way we get salvation. Now this word is creative. But remember it's not our word, it's the word of God. And all the time while we are confessing that, the Holy Spirit's operating. He is in our heart. He is working on the Word. This is when we first have come to Christ. He is working on the Word. And he does this in accordance with what is said in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, where it says these words in verse 23. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. So here is the account of what happens when we hear the word of the living God in relation to salvation, and the seed of that word is put into our heart by the Holy Spirit because we hear the truth of the gospel. Now, if people are not taught the truth of the gospel, how on earth are they going to have the seed to be put in their heart? And we know that that is put in our heart by the Holy Spirit because the Titus tells us that very clearly. Titus 3 verse 5. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. 
by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. That is what took place when we were born again. And further elucidation on that point is made by Jesus in John chapter 3, where he said, except we be born above, except we be born of God, except we be born of water and of the Spirit. And in the book of Ephesians, at chapter 5, it tells us very clearly that we are washed by the water of the Word. So the water refers to the Word. And when Peter tells us that it's the seed of the Word, and Timothy, uh, Paul says that it is by the Holy Spirit, we bring those two verses and thoughts together and relate them to what Jesus said in John chapter 3, that we have to be born of water and of the Spirit. There has to be the seed of the word of the truth of the gospel in our heart that is put there because we hear the gospel and the Holy Spirit uh, puts it there, writes it in our heart. Because Hebrews says that God said, I will write it in your heart. He will write his laws in our hearts. And so by the Spirit of God, that seed is put in our hearts or in our spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit is the water, uh, puts the water in. So the Word of God in our hearts is creative. He speaks and something takes place in our born-again experience. Reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Verse 6, for God who said, he spoke and created, let light shine, shine out, of our dark, out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So God said in creation, let there be light. He says in our recreation, let light shine out of the darkness. Isn't that wonderful? You know, it's most personal, most individual. God and you, God and me. He spoke and he said, there's darkness in that heart, let light shine. And the light is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. It's about glory. It's about heaven. It's not about earth. It's not about even our life on earth, basically. It's about the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's revealed to us of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5.17. In a personal act, God did something in us. Isn't that wonderful? It's something so personal that he spoke personally and said, let there be light. And when that light came in by the operation of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, which is the seed of God, the Word of the Gospel, not the Word of the Old Testament, the Word of the Gospel, the Word of the New Covenant, not the Word of the Old Covenant, not the Word of the Psalms, the word of the gospel came in and God did a creative act. He spoke from heaven because he said, let there be light. And he spoke a word in our hearts that we did not hear, that we had no knowledge of, that he was speaking, but that now we can see he did speak. It's personal. It's just not you go forward in the church and you pray the sinner's prayer and somebody counsels you and tells you you're born again and you have no idea what's been happening in your heart. You have no idea that the God in heaven has personally 
personally spoken in your heart to do a creative act. Now, we recognize that God's done something. Everybody who gets saved, you know, as soon as they're saved, you can see the light on their face. But we don't realize this that he has done. And so, at the same time, he's doing a creative act because it says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. Who created him a new creation? God. We didn't create ourselves. We were born into this world because of the desires of our parents. We had nothing to do with it. It was indeed part of God's creation. But we had nothing to do with our new creation. Nothing. God did a new creation in us. He's the only one who can create. We cannot create. And so there is created within us at that time a new person, a new being, a new spirit in actuality. Our spirit is recreated and that's the real us. And it's wonderful, I said uh, to my son one day, isn't it wonderful? You've got a new man in there. <laughs> it is wonderful, isn't it? We've got a new heavenly creation in here. This body will dissolve at some time or other or be changed at some time or other. But what's in here is eternal. It's a new creation created eternally for eternity, not created for time. So when time ceases in our lives, this new creation goes to be in eternity itself and, and lives there, lives on in eternity forever. Lives on. Doesn't get created again. Doesn't get started again. Lives on. That very spirit that is the seed of God that's in here will live on because it is released from the body through death or the coming of the Lord. And it's still living, it's released. But at the coming of the Lord, of course, it will get immortality. And when, if a person dies and goes to heaven, they get some kind of a spirit covering, according to Second Corinthians 5. But how wonderful. It's a new creation that God has given us. Looking at Ephesians 4, 24, we read, and it's a command, and to put on the new self. There's a new self inside of us. And we have to put it on sometimes because we, left, we leave the old self, the carnal nature, take the prominence. And that happens generally, generally through lack of prayer, lack of being in the spirit, and lack of filling our hearts with the word because we are washed by the water of the word and the, and the spirit of Christ in us does something within us when we have put on the new self. Now that new self is in us, otherwise we couldn't, couldn't put it on. So what the Apostle Paul is really saying is deny your carnal nature and instead let your new nature come to the fore because in that new nature is Christ himself. In that new nature is the Spirit of Christ. In that new nature is the Holy Spirit of God. And he is saying that it is the new self created. It's a creation. And this is what is a wonderful thing. We have in us that new self that is created after the likeness of God's true righteousness and holiness. And one version I've read reads, it is created uh, with the works already given us that we are to reproduce in our lives. In other words, that new creation in us has something within it that has the divine ability to bring forth the eternal holy acts that it is designed to do in righteous living here on this earth. 
I'll read it again. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. See? The spirit is to do with our spirit, not to do with our soul. Our soul can never be renewed. Our spirit is renewed. And it's not our mind that is renewed so much as the spirit that's in our mind. The spirit of Christ is not only in our spirits, but it extends to the mind that is the mind of Christ that somehow or other, in an inexplicable way, is part of our natural mind. So you have a natural body and a natural soul and a recreated spirit. And we also have a natural mind with its natural workings and memories and so forth. But at the same time, we also have a recreated spirit that is the, in that mind that is part of our mind that is the mind of Christ. Now, we can't explain how that operates and neither can we explain how the spirit and operates in connection with the body. No psychiatrist or psychologist could ever explain it. We just know that this is what God says happens and we believe it and it is a wonderful truth. There's something in us, something in us that is a power from God himself by his created word that enables us to live holy lives but we have to put on the new man. In other words, deny the old man. That does not mean we have to crucify the old man. There's that teaching been going around for ages that is, is unscriptural. We do not have to crucify the old man at all. How can you crucify something that has been crucified? How can you crucify something that is dead? Yeah. We just have to put it off because it says in Colossians that, that we were crucified with him. We were buried with him in death. We were on the cross with him. The Apostle Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. And what it really means is, I see myself hanging on the Christ with Christ, cross with Christ. I look back and by faith I can see I was hanging on the cross with Christ. And he was a terrible sinner, as we were. But by faith he could see that God had considered that he was crucified with Christ, his old nature. And he was buried with Christ and we were buried with Christ. A and even though we were buried with Christ and crucified with Christ, it's, it's a legal action because it's not effective from that point of view of salvation because we still have that carnal nature. But the power of sin has been removed of its power over us. We are not under the dominion of sin, even though the tendency to sin is there. But we are to live in the resurrection life of Christ because we were also risen with him. And so when we put off the old man, we're not crucifying him. We're putting him off and we're just saying, yes, my old man was crucified with Christ, is dead. I will not yield to it. And then we say, yes, I was resurrected with Christ. Now I'm putting on the new man. And you put on the new man with your realization that your old man is dead and your new man has risen with Christ and you are living and walking in the resurrection life of Christ by the power of the Spirit of Christ. Because going through Romans 8 and Galatians 5, we have to recognize this as a distinction between the Spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit of God. Because Christ lives in us, who is the hope of glory. The Holy Spirit doesn't live in us as the hope of glory. Christ lives in us as the hope of glory. Christ is the one who is in our heart as Savior. And we are saved from sin through Christ. Jesus Christ died on the, on the cross and he performed the act of redemption on the cross and he rose from the dead. The Holy Spirit wasn't on the cross. The Holy Spirit didn't rise from the dead. So in relation to sin, it is the Spirit of Christ who is in us and who brings forth his fruits of righteousness through us. But then we have the Holy Spirit who waters the word. Put it that way. He waters the word. He, uh, when, when we hear the word, he teaches us in relation to the word about salvation, for instance. 
we should let the Holy Spirit teach us. But you know, a lot of people think the Holy Spirit is teaching them and they get the weirdest ideas and go off track. You know why? Because Scripture must interpret itself. You have to have the Scripture here and other Scriptures that show you what the interpretation is to be. And that's the line of rule. That's the rule for our understanding of the Word of God. And that comes into play. Because Jesus said, if any man will to know the will of my Father which is in heaven, he'll know. If we want to know what are the true doctrines, if we want with all our heart to know the truths of the gospel, we will eventually find them. Might take a while, might take years, because there has been inculcated into our very minds and fibers of our being such errors from the pulpit, such errors from godly teachers whom we have always esteemed and would still esteem. And we ourselves have picked up the errors because they were based on the errors we heard and were based on the errors we taught. And as babies, we did not have the ability to find out the truth for ourselves. Nobody can ever think they can do without a teacher. There's the ministry of teacher in the body of Christ. But that teacher had better make sure that he is teaching truth. And most of us, and all of us have been teachers of some kind or other, we, we have all taught errors at some stage of our lives. We have all taught errors. The bulk of us have taught about the millennium. Now, I have never taught it extensively. I wasn't particularly interested in doing so. It must have been something in my heart. No, it was wrong, but my mind said it was right. <laughs> uh, but that's taught and we accept it. So then because we accept that, we become carnal and worldly in our minds. And I believe that's one reason the Church of Jesus Christ is astray on worldliness and on, on the worldly evil rock music, for one thing. Because... We've got our eyes centered on a millennium on earth. And I was trying to show an Indian pastor the truth about this. He read my book and he didn't want to accept it. He was an old Pentecostal who'd been in the Salon Pentecostal church and uh, they were very severe in their doctrines. And of course, the millennium was part and parcel of their doctrine because they heard it from British missionaries. Now, he was very low caste even though he had been a bank manager, and he would never have been a bank manager a hundred years ago, but things have altered somewhat in India. And I, I mention that because I think this is the reason he had this attitude. Then he said, ah, oh, that means I won't be ruling and reigning with Christ. He wasn't thinking of a spiritual reign, he was thinking of a reign over people. And I can sympathize with him and understanding because all his life he's been castigated as low caste. And so, to him, the idea of a thousand years where he's reigning over cities or, and people, he who has been low caste, would be very attractive. I don't know to this day if he has altered his mind. Hopefully he, he might have. But there we have it. We've all taught error. We had better find out the truth and we had better know the truth. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. And the Son, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. So what does this verse mean? In the Old Testament days, God spoke only through his prophets to the children of Israel. He did not speak in any other way. So what is conveyed in the prophets' messages were what God wanted the children of Israel to hear for them at that time. When it was in relation to the future, the, there were prophecies about Jesus Christ by the school. 
There were prophecies in relation to heaven, somewhat. All the early truths of the gospel were there in very minute form. But Jesus said, the prophets prophesied until John. In other words, they were prophesying about everything that would occur for the children of Israel until John came. Until John came, Israel, or what was left of it, we, we have learned that the ten tribes of Israel weren't there, and most of Judah wasn't there, and only a little bit being Benjamin, because that was a smaller tribe. And Benjamin, the Benjamites, inhabited Galilee. And what was left of the Judahites inhabited Judah, along with all the other who were, who were Edomites and who were of the descendants of Esau. Until that time when John came and preached repentance on the banks of the River Jordan, everybody in that country, land, that God, that owned God, was under the words of the prophets. When John came, finished. They started a new era with what we know as under the New Testament, which is the New Covenant. And the, the Old Testament is full of prophecy. Look at all the prophets who writ, wrote them, starting from Moses. All the way through, they were prophets. David was a prophet, even though he was a king. But when you come to the New Testament, where are all the prophecies that they had, like similar to what they had in the Old Testament? They don't exist. They aren't there. We are told very little about our future. The ones who were told the most about their future were those who were in the nation of Israel at the time when Jesus preached to them in Matthew 24, Luke 22, and Mark, uh, I think it's, uh, <laughs> now you've got me, Mark 11, I think it is, uh, when Jesus preached about the destruction of Israel the destruction of the, the nation as a nation, the destruction of the temple, the destruction of the priesthood. And that was quite prophetic when you read those chapters because those who know history will tell you that everything he said took place. Now, there are some verses there that relate to his coming again, I do believe. Uh, but in relation to his coming again, he did say, no man knows the hour. And in relation to the destruction of Jerusalem, they knew the hour because it was already given in, in Daniel chapter 9 where so many years were given and they knew that it would happen soon because they were able to count. Those who were wise were able to count and they would have known. Because when Jesus was born, Herod said, where is he? Because they knew it was the right time. Well, that, when you're looking at the New Testament, except for the book, when you, come to the, when you come to the New Testament, except for the book of Revelation, there is no prophetic word for the Church of Jesus Christ. Not one. You can't find one. You can find possibilities in relation as to what's going to happen. For instance, in 2 Thessalonians chapter, chapters 1 and 2, where it speaks about the lawless in the original who will be revealed. It doesn't talk about an antichrist and the mystery of iniquity that has to be revealed. But most people don't even know what that is. And so it's not particularly prophetic. So why should we be looking at the prophecies of the Old Testament to find them fulfilled in our day when they don't exist, according to what Jesus said. It was for the children of Israel, for the Hebrews, for the Israelites. So getting back to Hebrews chapter 1, the very word Hebrews tells us to whom it was sent. It was sent to the Hebrews. It was not sent to the Jews. You don't find the letter to the Jews. God did not send any letter to the Jews. They were too evil a people. The Jews 
word are not Hebrews. The Jews were even in the times that this letter was written were mainly the descendants of Esau. And God's not going to be interested in speaking to the descendants of Esau except in judgment, which he has done in several books in the Old Testament. The descendants of Esau have no part as such in the kingdom of Christ. It's just the descendants of, e of Isaac, who, if they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour, and only the Saviour, not as King, to rule over Jerusalem, only a saviour will they have a part in the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Christ. So it's written to the Hebrews, but let me say this. It's every book in the Bible is specifically written to a certain person or people for a certain time in relation to their situation condition at, the, at that particular time. But at the same time, we recognize it is God's word for us because it's part of the scriptures. The same applies to the book of Hebrews. It was written specifically to Hebrews because some of them were wanting to go back to temple worship and in doing so there was a great danger. But at the same time, the book of Hebrews is just as applicable to us today who are not of Israel, naturally, as it, as it was to the people to whom it was written. It's for us. And long ago, God spoke in many ways by his prophets. But in these last days, and the last days, of course, but in these days, is it? But in these last days, the last days began at the resurrection. They are the last days. But we today talk about the last days and think it's, that in the Bible is speaking about the end of what is called our dispensation, but there's no mention of it being a dispensation in the Bible. No, the last days were the last days before the destruction of Jerusalem for these particular people who were not believers, if there were any there, or who were going away from Christ. Because the last days of Israel ended in AD 70. Those were the last days. And so this person was writing, was the writing to the Hebrews before the destruction of Jerusalem, it would appear, around that time. And so she says, the last days. He has spoken to us, and that means us, by his son. So in other words, the writer is saying, in the Old Testament, God spoke, and we had to listen because what came through the prophets was from him. But today, something different has happened. We have to listen to what comes from Jesus Christ. And so that's why, if we want to know anything at all about the future, we need to listen to what Jesus Christ has taught, firstly in the Gospels and secondly by the Holy Spirit as they spoke words or wrote words through the Holy Ghost that we uh, have received today as our scriptures. So let's be clear about this because the Lord Jesus Christ is the creator of his church. His church is not any particular denomination. His church is not of any particular nation. His church does not recognize Israelites. His church does not rec recognize Judahites. His church does not recognize Gentiles. His church is invisible in the sense that it is part of something that God has done in the spiritual realm that we can't observe. We see the results. So every person who is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and obeying him is a part of the church 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that church has, is something that is, is eternal. That church is something that is spiritual. The church is not a building. The church is not even one assembly of people. The church is every single person of all ages who has been born again of the Word and of the Spirit and who has continued on to be in Christ. So who is the Creator? The Lord Jesus Christ. Now God created Israel. He tells us that in the Old Testament. He formed Israel Himself. He created Israel. He, he created it as a nation to belong to Himself. He created it to be a kingdom of priests. But it never eventuated in, in, in happening in the way it, God would have liked it to have happened. But nevertheless, He brought it into being. That was His creation. So who has brought into being the church of Jesus Christ? The Lord Jesus Christ. It's the church of Jesus Christ. We had nothing to do with the creation of the church of Jesus Christ. And in a sense, when a pastor says, oh, that's my church, that's my, that's my people, they're not his. They're the Lord's. It's the Lord's church. It's the Lord's people. And so let us get it into our hearts. This church of which we are a part is the creation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 16 to 18. It speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ where it says, For by himself things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He, as it says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn or most prominent or the preeminence of all creation, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. He was never born, of course. The meaning of the word verse, firstborn is what I've just said. So he has created everything. Everything includes his church. Because it says he has created things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. He has created it. We are not only created of God as being put into the family of God, but we are the creation as being part of the church that is His creation. And it's a wonderful creation. So we as human beings personally, without the operation of the Spirit of God, do not create the church. We build church buildings that are not in the Bible, but of course they're necessary. But we do not create the church. In fact, there is a hymn, a, a, a hymn that says, uh, the church is one foundation. I'm Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. So we individually are a new creation by the water and the word and the spirit, as we have said. But this hymn writer says, the church. So if we individually are a creation of Christ and of God, collectively we are a creation of Christ and of God. We are a creation of God. We are the church of the living God. We are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That church is not the Roman Catholic Church. That church is not the Protestant Church. That church is all believers in Jesus Christ, even those believers who don't know the whole truth of which the world is full. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, telling them to deny ungodly lusts. That's what a believer does. Denies ungodly lusts. 
that specifies who a believer is. It's in Titus chapter 2, I think it's verse 18. In Colossians 1.13, He has delivered us, Christ has delivered us, from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, God has delivered us, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. All the work of God, all the work of Christ. We were in the domain of darkness. Now it does not say the domain of Satan. People make a mistake when they say we are born with the nature of Satan. We are not born with the nature of Satan. We're born with the nature of sin. And nowhere does it ever say we are the children of Satan. The only place where Jesus said that was to the Pharisees who were the Jews who were following the Babylonian idolatry, occult and witchcraft. We are called sinners. And we were in the domain of darkness because we were in the control of the prince of the power of the earth. He controlled us because of our sin. And he, he rules the atmosphere. He rules this world in effect. And it tells us this, Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins not in Satan, in which you once walked. We walked in trespasses and sin. Following the course of this world, of course this world is under the power of Satan. We followed the way the world was. And we followed the appearance of the power of the earth, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of darkness. So what does the Bible say about Satan? and unbelievers, one, that we were walking in trespasses in sin, following the course of this world, too, that we were following the prince of the power of the air or atmosphere, which is Satan, and he is the spirit that is now at work, who in, not, the, not his children, but in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the deeds and of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Our nature was children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Nowhere does it say we're the children of Satan. Those verses describe our condition as sinners in relation to God, the world, the devil, our, our own nature and our walk. And that's the exact picture. So we are not children of Satan. We're not children of Satan. That is reserved from the Jewish Judaizers of Jesus' day and who have continued on to this day, and who I believe are Babylon. So we have been taken out of that darkness and transferred to the kingdom of light because there is light in us. We are not the children of darkness anymore. Light in us overcomes the darkness. That's what it says in John chapter 1, that Christ is the light, and he came into the world and the light overcomes the darkness. So when the light of Christ comes into our heart, his light overcomes the darkness in us. Isn't that wonderful? See, we didn't overcome our own darkness. His light did. It's all of God. We're totally recreated by God. Nothing in our new creation that we have done to form this who we are in Christ so we have this wonderful knowledge and understanding as to who we were and who we now are and the difference it is. And it is all performed by his words. 
and we have faith in his word even as we believe his word and have faith that he created the world so we have faith in him as our savior and that he has recreated us amen